Hey everyone, it's Classic DM. We're going to do another DM's Guide episode. In this one, we're going to design the throne room encounter. And we're going to give you a brief overview of how we got here, what's going to happen, what some of the goals are. I thought it might be kind of fun for folks who want to see the DM's Guide, uh, the DM's side of the story. So let's, uh, let's get right into it, okay? Let's not waste any more time. What we've got happening next in our adventure is uh, in the Glacial Rift of the Frost Giant Jar, our party... Now, as you remember from the very beginning, massive storyline, trying to capture, trying to uh, rescue the stolen child. You can read all the storyline stuff on the Patreon site. They went to the um, Steading of the Hill Giant Chief. They destroyed everything there. They've got some clues. Uh, that led them to the Glacier Rift for Frost Giant Jarl. This is our party of seven. You have Mercedes the Fighter, Zolaris the Fighter, uh, Elephanisi the Monk, Vrinjar the Assassin, Feltrino the Druid, Antolo the Cleric, Obscure the Illusionist, they have a number of party items, including some maps. Let's look at those maps in a little bit more detail, because what we're going to talk about today is that massive throne room. This is pretty much probably the second biggest encounter in the entire series. Much bigger than the throne room that was in the Steading of the Hill Giant Chief. Now, they had no problems with the Steading of the Hill Giant room. They uh, pretty much wiped the floor with the place. Now, this is an epic group of characters. They're very, very powerful. So, this next encounter is... A lot harder. I would put it on par with an EverQuest 1 raid encounter, like the Emperor or something like that. So let's take a look at what we've got here in terms of maps. This is all player maps. This right here is a player map they discovered in one of the upper levels of the Glacial Rift. Now the second one here is a map of the lower level. So remember, if you're playing the game and you've been doing, you've been going through everything, and this is our, these are our kids over here, you may remember the last episode had them uh, kind of in a tight spot. Uh, and let's go through exactly what happened there real quick before we get into this throne room. But the party right now, if you look on the right-hand side here, they're in uh, they're in this area here. They were just got kind of done fighting this Ogre Magi who blasted them with a ray of cold, kind of set up as a cone of cold to make it harder. I always like to make things harder because these are epic characters with max health, max hit points, and the monsters are max health, max hit points too. So we don't do any random health rolls. So we don't have any 47 health hill giants. They're 64 health max. So... They have been in these areas that are marked blue. So they fell down over the, this area up here. Felcherna fell in the hole at the Remorhas fight, fight. They fought these two ice uh, white dragons. Then they worked their way to the west here, into this guard room, moved this boulder out of the way. Some more guards here. They didn't go explore these upper passageways. If you know the module, you know what's up here, and you probably know why they end up fighting an Ogre Magi, because there's a di di diplomat group here. Half the diplomat group is down the big throne room. Another thing that's very interesting is if you know the module itself, you may remember me telling you about that, is that way the original module is for the throne room is very tame. Uh, they're basically saying that there's nothing here. In fact, quote unquote, here's basically the one sentence right here. Uh, the great cavern of the uh, great cavern hall of the Jarl, various tables and benches now line the east and west walls, pushed out of the way until a time of need. Caged fire beetles dimly illuminate the place. It appears completely deserted for guard, except for guard posts A and B. Now, if you saw the map drawing session where we drew this map, this map for this area is incredibly huge. So let's take a look at that a little bit. We've got some screenshots. So we're about to step into deep trouble. <laughs> this group doesn't know. They don't know what's in the next room except for what Obscura, and you see this picture here, Obscura went used her invisibility spell. This is the Illusionist, and she scouted to the south. Uh, the bottom picture is a snapshot from one of the episodes with the Ogre Magi floating in the air, appeared out of nowhere, dropped his invisibility, and blasted the whole group. The group had just wiped out these four uh, Frost Giants here. And this section of the map over here on the lower right-hand picture on the right-hand side, you see these square columns. These are like stone columns with two massive fire pits in front of them. And this is kind of a cloakroom. The area where the party is is kind of a cloakroom. But to the right of that, which is the east on the orientation on this map, is this incredibly huge throne room. So after that fight happened, before that fight happened, Obscure was able to go sneak and peek and take a look into that area, and so was uh, Varinjar. Now while we left, left off, the problem was that in this upper picture, Mercedes is charmed. Now that's not going to be a big deal because the cleric will probably dispel magic on that as soon as the next battle starts, and there, a lot of people are really badly damaged. In fact, here's the damage sheet from the last episode. Uh, Mercedes was down to 95 health, Zolos was at 112. Elephanisi almost died. She got back up to 33. Vrinjar got up to, is at 53. Um, Felchurna is at 48. Um, Antola is at 59. Um, Obscura is down to 49 health. That's really, really bad. And most of that damage came from the Ogre Magi. You should watch that episode. It's very nasty. 
normally a red code spell is just like a single target but we you know i like to make things harder this is an epic party they should be put on their heels and try to use their abilities more if you just run around mailing rolling to hit all day long and you win it's not very exciting so that's one thing you should always consider in your own campaigns is tailor and change the campaign to be more challenging for your players based upon their strength and their power curve so as they uh start wiping out encounters that you thought were going to be hard, you need to boost the damage up. Don't cheat the dice rolls, but boost the damage up and boost the difficulty. One, there was a forum posting one of the Facebook groups about how do you like to do this? There's two ways I like to do it. One of them is start making where the enemies have max health. Uh, the second thing you can do is start throwing more reinforcements. So the more and more reinforcements, the more the players are going to be worried about their positioning and where they are in uh, conjunction of the placement of uh, frost giants. So you have people being surrounded on the fine ridge grid like this where people who can hit who do swing throughs and things like that. So let's take a look at a quick little video I captured and I'm going to turn this background music down a little bit here. We've got a little tavern music going in the background. That's from our uh, massive party that's happening down the hall. And let, let you see um, what was it that Obscura was able to discover when she went down. So in this little, this is a video clip from my phone. And just to let you know, this is a room they have not been to. This is an Ogre Magi diplomat, diplomat room. They are in this area here. So this video is going to pan down. I'm going to let it loop in the background. I'll just talk on top of it, okay? So there's the party from about two episodes ago. We'll just pause that real quick here. They're in this upper guard room area. They went through this gate. Obscura went through the gate invisible, and there's a number of frost giants that are in this area. So this video was taken before that episode, right? And as she worked her way down, she discovered everything here, and she got... They picked up on her and she got revealed from visibility. So a nasty fight happened, which was this fight happening here. They end up killing all those frost giants and dragging their bodies away. Then they had the ogre magi who they had to wipe out um, after that. So now this is the real problem. If you look about beyond this real celebrated entry here, these huge, massive 10-foot diameter braziers, you have this gigantic wassail going on, like a Christmas celebration if you want to, if you want to put some more twist on it. Look how many people are in attendance at this uh, wassail. It's just absolutely nuts. And I got some more images of this too to share with you. So this is, uh, this is how big the next room really, really is. Very, very nasty. It's going to be very brutal. Um, when I did the map drawing episode, you can see how this map was done. You actually had to do it in three sections. We had to do this section here, which is uh, actually the west side. Then we had to do this east side, and then we did the south side. We decided just to skip this because there's nothing but a wall here. If you know the module, you know what goes down that way, and you know what goes this way. It's like an arms room, and this goes to a kitchen. So this area is really big. And so you have this incredible table in the front with these you know, other faction stone giant, another frost giant Jarl, a friar giant visitor. You have the frost giant Jarl himself. Grugnur is his name. Um, you have all these frost giant elites. I imagine a scene from the Viking series where everyone's having this big party and a celebration or something from the Tudors. So you're going to have that kind of vibe. You've got some hill giants who traveled over here. There's a few hill giants here and sitting here. So that's what that looks like. Let's go look at some pictures of that in a little bit more detail. So if you were Obscura and you were to go down the hallway, this picture here is kind of from the player's perspective. So if you're playing at the table, things will be revealed to you going that way. In this situation, this is facing south. So these four guards here have been killed since this photograph was taken. But you've got all this stuff in here, okay? All these guys in this room here are alive and kicking and ready to go. Now, it's a very loud room. There's a lot of music being played. There's a lot of drinking. There's a lot of yelling. Earlier, there was a bunch of frost giants who ran down the hallway to alert guards, but they only alerted the guards in the cloakroom in this room. So no one has run into this room and woken up. So everyone's got their back turned. Everyone, this whole massive wassail party Christmas celebration is all facing the, the front where all the elites are. So you have this, all kinds of interesting characters here. What we're going to do today in the show is we're going to lay out the health and the damage and the names and the details of all those individual characters. And I'm going to show you some interesting points about the game. We have a 3.5 uh, monster manual, Beast Jerry from Pathfinder, 4th edition monster manual, and 5th edition monster manual uses influences. And of course, we also have our 1st uh, edition entries as well. I want to talk about this because I think it's important. Um, when you're creating something like this and you've got to figure out what these encounters are, don't just pull up the default stuff. Don't just look at the player, the monster manual, and say, okay, it's a cloud giant, it has X, and it can do Y. Add personality to these things. Treat the monsters as if they're heroes. 
Doesn't mean you need to make a bunch of character sheets with dexterity and charisma rolls and all that, but give them different weapons. Give them different weapon damages. Give them a name. Um, give them different armor sets. Think about what they're doing at the time. If they're big at a big wassail party, some of these guys are, are going to be wearing massive, glorious chainmail and weapons and have magic weapons on their back. I mean, some of them are going to be dressed in clothing. Some are going to be scrubs. Uh, some are going to be representing their kingdom. And here's a shot of the throne itself. You know, so we got a lot of opportunities to do neat things here. We got to design the actual Grugner himself. And just to give you a quick sneak peek, if we look in the actual original uh, module, in fact, I'll do it here on the right-hand side while I'm doing it on the, uh, on, the, on, the, on the webcam. Where is Grugner in here? He's in here somewhere. This is his antechamber. This is his private chamber. Let me find it in the paper version first, and then I'll find the page for you. Audience chamber, guard area, weapons cave, caverns of the Carls, the Jarl's hunting pack, polar bears. Where is he? He's in here somewhere, isn't he? Males, males, antechamber. Here's all his goodies behind the walls. This is escape route. Okay. Here we go. Here we're getting closer to it here. Cavern, cavern. Here we go. So the Jarl. This guy only has 80 health. I'm going to zoom in on this panel right here for you a little bit, okay? This is designed for the original version of the first edition, right? And in first edition, everyone's rolling for health for the monsters. You notice a lot of times you have monsters, oh, 47 health, 53 health, 64 health. They're like a, an eight-hit dice creature could have 64 health. In this situation, when they made bosses, they gave them almost pretty much max hit points. So here is the entry for uh, the Jarl himself. The Jarl, 80 hit points. Every single one of our frost giants in our campaign have it. They're all eight hit dice. Let's pull up one of our sheets here. Ogre Magi, Ogre Magi, more Ogre Magi. This is the player health. These are some hill giants that we had before. Here we go, frost giants. So we use 10 hit dice for the frost giants. So compare that to him, okay? So if you look at the original, <laughs> sound like the guy from the South Park, okay? So look at the frost giant here. This is a uh, 10 hit dice plus one to four type of creature. Our armor class 4, we keep that respectful of the typical, this is a typical frost giant. The regular frost giant damage is uh, 4 to 24, um, which is like 6 four-sided dice, total pain in the butt. We boost that up to 66, which is 6 to 36. Now these kinds of things sound like, my god, your campaign is brutal. Well, we have heroic characters. Okay, so we don't have run of the mill level seven uh, scrubs that are thinking they're going to sneak through and pick up treasure and get experience points for gold, which is the thing I don't believe in. Um, we have characters that are uh, really ready to kick some serious butt. So let's see here. If we go up here to, you've probably seen these a million times, but just for example, just take a look at Mercedes, okay? I mean, she's hurt. Their armor class isn't absurd. They're not like negative 10 or some ridiculous amount. They don't have a lot of magic items. Their weapons are relatively basic. They don't have a lot of crazy strength bonuses except for Vrinjar. But she's got max health. So the max health plus the conniving ability to play intelligently. Zollers has a lot of health. Um, he has a well, basic magic weapon, a glaive. I mean, a burning glaive, that just, that just 1d10 plus 5 and plus a 1d8 burning dot. That's not that incredible. It's not like using the sword of cast or something. So we don't have gods over here or demigods. What we do have is maximum powerful characters. So let's take a look at Elephant EC. 40 health. That's max health for level 10 monk. I mean, she's a D4 health character. She moves really quickly. Her armor class is zero. That's not that good. Half these things can hit her on a A or higher. So... The characters are powerful from their health, resiliency, and some of their abilities. They're not overloaded with magic items. They're not overloaded with low armor class. And that was because I wanted them to have a chance to use their abilities, to play the character classes in the purest sense, to use all their abilities as a class to survive, not rely on magic items. So let's go back over here. To where we're looking at the, uh, the Jarl. This t the Jarl sits on the table with his chain jacket with a huge shield, plus one, plus four versus missiles, nearby armor class one with a shield without. His sword is a plus four two-hander at his hip and a platinum drinking horn set with gems, 1,000 GP value each. You get more experience for getting his drinking horn than you would actually killing the guy. Uh, but that's a topic for another conversation. Across the table is his lady, and this is his female. So that is in the original module because the Jarl in the original module is not hanging out in the throne room having a party so we changed all that so we took this area here that you see circled in the in the yellow and we made this a full tilt balls of wall crazy party with every visitor and every ambassador seated at tables by pecking order we have uh, uh other jarls from the other frost giant kingdom sitting here we have a a friar giant ambassador from the uh, g3 
the Hall of the Fire Giant King. We have a Stone Giant from another module that's not even designed. He's got two incredible Winter Wolves as opposed to just a Polar Bear or two locked away in another room. So we need to design all this stuff because it's not in the original module. So that's what we're going to do today. Um, so the first thing I like to do is to remember to uh, take, a, if you're going to do this, Remember to take in consideration the in your DM screen or your DM's guide your to hit numbers. So you've got a party that has maybe your party that you're playing with they have like decent AC like three and two and one. Now if you're playing fifth edition the numbers are different, but if they're playing like plate mail and shield is AC two in first edition and in second edition. Say you've got guys running around negative two, negative three, negative four. That means they're gonna be harder to hit. But you need to always remember that like listen, these frost giants are gonna be hit dice ten. Okay. So for them to hit someone that's AC 0, it's not going to be that hard. AC 0 and hit dice 10 monsters are going to need a 10. That's basically a 50% chance to hit. On top of that, then they're hitting really, really hard. Um, as in, like, the damage numbers we had here was 4 to 24. We're using 66 damage for these guys. Where is that number again? Here we go. The Frost Giant. So easier for them to hit you. Tons of damage when they do hit you, but the damage is all going to be mitigated because they're going to be averages and means. So 66, the average is what? Like 18 or something? So that's where it gets exciting. So things can spike in damage and things can and be punky damage or there might be complete misses happening. Uh, so the players are going to get a chance to probably mow through large groups, but they need to be careful because they could take a lot of damage along the way. They're not going to get one-shotted or anything like that unless they get really unlucky. But that's but that uh, if that happens, there'll be a massive retreat set that's going to go on. Okay, so... Let's take a look at this. So if we talk about this room, it's going to have uh, this massive population of characters here. What's the first thing we should probably do? Well, I think the most fun thing to do right off the bat is design the king himself, design this stone, uh, stone giant, design this other frost giant, Jarl, and design this uh, fire giant visitor and these two winter wolves. Every single one of these, one, two, three, four, five, six characters are going to be epic, incredible, unique. In fact, the frost giant Jarl himself needs to probably be the most epic MF in the whole the, uh, dungeon, okay? It can't be just some run-the-mill joker. You know, something that's kind of like kind of like this, right? That's why I got these huge, crazy minis to represent. I got more on the way to represent this group of party that's sitting in the front. Now, the paint jobs aren't awesome, but they're better than nothing. So here's what we're going to do. Let's get some inspiration going. What's the best place for inspiration? Take a look at your monster manual. So let's go back to 3.5. Uh, this is like version 3. So if you just go to the old, now I don't have my first edition print books anymore. I have bought PDFs from the DMs Guild. But if you just go to the uh, the old books, this one thing about the game that's just amazing. It never, never, never stops being cool. All these old reference books are good for the DM for uh, inspiration. Let's get these kids moved back a little bit over here. Sorry. Knock them out the way a little bit so you can get this book turned towards you. All right. So if you go to the 3.5 entry, like page 121 or what have you, you have an entry. The art in this book is okay. It's not great. But this is, uh, this is what, 2002, 2001 or something like that. I think this edition 3 was done right before, like maybe 2003, right before uh, the release of 4th uh, uh, edition. Um, so if you look in here, you know, you've got these pictures of what a hill giant looks like and a stone giant and a cloud giant. So we've got a heroic character on the bottom here. This stone giant. Let's do him first. So let's find a stone giant entry in here. Uh, this is all about hill giants, storm giants. Here you go. Here's a stone giant entry. I'm just going to turn it this way and just give you a quick little tip here and read this. These are 14 hit dice in 3.5. Now in first edition, this one thing you have to be careful with. In first edition, where's a stone giant? Stone, stone. Here it is. In first edition, these guys are hit dice nine. That's a completely different animal. So you don't want to lift the numbers, the damage numbers of the stat block, as people like to call it, or the challenge rating or reflex saves. That's all third edition stuff. Uh, what you want to do is kind of read through the ideas here. So stone giants are undeserved reputation as rock thrower hooligans. Uh, stone giants for thick leather garments, dyes in shades of brown and gray to match the stone around them. So stone giants, you think of them as like living in caves. Uh, they mostly playful at night, fond of throwing rock contests. So it sounds like a bunch of crazy Scottish barbarians from Braveheart movie, right? So they live in caves, they have cave bears around them. So that's what the third 3.5 edition said about them, right? Let's see what the, when Paizo decided to reinvent these guys, what did they think of Stone Giant? What's their take? This Jason Bullman, or Bullman, I can't pronounce his name properly. What did they think of Stone Giant was all about, right? So here we go here. The Stone Giant, and this one, you know, is AC 22, because this is once again a permutation of 3.5 during the OGL open game license with strength 27, huge numbers. These numbers don't have to work in the first edition. 
improved rock catching, rock throwing. Stone giants prefer thick leather garments dyed in shades of brown and gray to match the stone around them. So that's the same theme lifted basically verbatim almost from the third edition Monster Manual. Adults are about 12 feet high. They fight from a distance wherever possible. So, so far, stone giant elders, hey, that's an interesting idea, develop special abilities related to the environment. Uh, called elders. These stone giants have charisma scores, blah, blah, blah. Once per day, they can use stone shape, stone tail, transmute rock to bud, transmute rock. Uh, so they'll get some spell casting abilities. So then kind of go back and check your uh, stone giant entry here and see what we got here. Let's zoom in a little bit on this one. Okay. And we're going to look at this right column here. These are fine with K bears. 75% likely to have one to four guarding their lair. Well, these guys aren't going to be in your lair. So what are we going to do with that? They have females, blah, blah, blah. They're playful. Especially at night. Uh, as you can see here, this whole playful at night throwing rocks theme has permeated the game for 40 years. Um, there's no mention of them having any kind of uh, stone to mud or special magical ability, so let's not do that. I'm much more of a traditional historical fiction kind of a guy. Uh, if you have a magical creature, it's fine for a stone giant. These guys are tall and lanky and skinny, and we got a stone giant in here somewhere. Where is where stone giants from? Uh, here's a bunch of hill giants. We have some special stone giants in here somewhere. I think it was this guy. Here we go. So that's an interesting influence. That's the Pathfinder take, which is just basically a, re a replication of 3.5. Now we go to 4th edition. So 4th edition was the MMO version of D&D. Uh, of &D. So let's go take a look and see what they're saying in here. Now what we're looking for is inspiration. We're not looking for stat blocks. So Fire Giant, beautiful art piece there. Absolutely brilliant. I wish I knew the name of the authors. I should really research that more. Storm Giants. Uh, storm giant, storm giant. They look great, awesome. Look like World of Warcraft. Gibbering beast. Okay, where's the where's the stone giant? Earth giant, eh, hill giant, fire giant. So it looks like in this version of this uh, the fourth edition, they left the stone giant out. So, but they did an earth giant instead. But that's more like a, a Dota hero, right? It's not really like a a regular giant. So you have fire giant. It would be alphabetical. You would have. Storm Giants, they completely skipped the Stone Giant in 4th edition. So that's not really going to help us much, so we just set that aside for now. Let's go to 5th edition, the grand one that everyone's playing today. Uh, really well done, really resurrected a game, really cool stuff. I haven't played it yet, I can't wait to play it sometime. Right now we're reliving the past. So this has got a whole section on Giants, lots of writing, lots of little iconography, beautiful paintings on the side, these are great. Let's go look and talk about Fire Giants, talk about Cloud Giants, Frost Giants, what they're all about, Hill gi Stone Giants. So in this situation, we start to see some of this magic stuff. Stone Giants are reclusive, quiet, and peaceful as long as they're left alone. So now they're like solo guys. Before they were, um, you know, what were they? Playful and running around in caves with cave bears. Now they're stoic and alone and live by themselves. So that's fine. Then they have granite gray skin, gaunt features. Okay, the whole gaunt, skinny, tall thing still, still going full stream, right? Um, These are private creatures hiding their lives in art away from the world. Art, well, they did cave art or something. It's kind of weird. Secluded in caves, the homes of stone giants, cave networks, their towns, rocky tunnels. Doesn't sound like a social society. In their dark, quiet caves, stone giants wordlessly chip away at elaborate carvings, measuring time. That's kind of an interesting creature. That's more of an individual encounter as opposed to a social group. In the first edition, the stone giants are much more of a social group. So they're part of this whole, you know, if there'd be a stone giant jarl or a stone giant king. And uh, even though they have cave bears, you can see them from this picture here. They're going to be like prehistoric man giant version carvers and seers the graceful athletes dreamers under the sky so there's a lot of interesting twists here but these are more kind of this is more like a um individual type of uh giant not really something you'd see that'd be out with a big group of friends have a huge social group so here's a good point to see here hill giant right so here's a hill giant in fact this is the hill giant that we use in the here's a hill giant okay hill giant fire giant so we've got one of those in here too don't we where's our little fire giant uh, we've got here's a here's one here. Hard to get these bad boys out. So you've got a fire giant. So this is the height. Stone giant, taller, lankier. See the difference in the silhouette here. So we've got a fire giant. Let's put these above. There's a female. Hill giant. Then you have stone giant. Then you have frost giant. Right. That's got this guy here. And then we get the cloud giant. And then we get the storm giant. But these two aren't going to be in this campaign. But we we have fire giants are sh shorter, squatter, fatter, more like this. Right. Frost Giants are taller, uh, huger. This is 21 feet tall. And this will give you a sense of how tall this is. Let's just use Varenjar. Varenjar is like 6 foot 4. Okay? So Varenjar is 6 foot 4. So you take 1, 2, 3 and a half Varenjars to equal in height. So this is guys taller than a basketball goal. So this is actually to scale, to tell you the truth. So if these two guys were fighting on a battlefield like this, this is about how big they'd be. His head comes up to the guy's kneecap. 
That's pretty cool, huh? So now for the stone giant, let's get back on track here. We're getting off target a little bit. Let's just leave these kids down here so you take a look at them. Let's design the stone giant guys that we have here. All right. I'm just going to put this other, put these other books up here. So the first thing I want to do is remember to keep the numbers in line with the uh, edition you're playing in. Okay. So let's just take a look at this. Hit dice nine. So the first thing I always like to do, and many kind of basic, this is going to be a stone giant. I like the word elder. We'll call him an elder. That means like a church elder or something. This is a leadership person, maybe the smarter, an older, wiser shaman type of a guy, right? So if you're talking about this throne room, this guy sitting right here on the right table, this huge carved obsidian drow dragon bone sitting next to this other huge massive frost giant. You have this skinny, gaunt, um, uh, storm stone giant elder. So we're going to put the hit dice here. And then we're going to put the armor class here, and we'll put it to hit AC 0 here. We'll figure that out in a minute. And I want to put a damage number here. So we'll put that there. And then we'll just put his health number down here. Now, what I want to also do is say, is there anything, uh, any kind of weapon or gear here? All right. So just take a look at what we got here. Hit dice 9. Okay, let's just boost that up by 2. Let's make it a hit dice 11. Now, well, the moment we do that, we have to go double check our DM screen. So with monster hit dice, as long as they're in the 10 and 11 range, they used to be a 9. Then we're going to boost this guy up to hit dice 11. So his chance to hit AC 0 is going to go all the way down to 10. You see this right here? This is the AC 0 column. So we're going to go ahead and boost him up to the 10 to the 11 range. That's not too bad. So his AC to hit AC 0 is going to be a 10. Okay, let's put that there like that. And... Uh, What's this base armor class? So these guys, by default, they have, what do they got? An AC of zero? Okay, that must be something to do with the skin or anything. Since these guys are running around wearing leather armor, it must be something with how the thick their skin is. So let's put this guy in some kind of fanciful uh, ring mail jacket with uh, something you might see like a Sumerian would wear, like a banded. So I'm going to put a little armor note here. So he's going to have uh, leather... And it's going to be banded. I wish I could pull up a reference picture for you. You know, I just might have a really cool reference picture for you. Let me pull that up real quick. Be patient here for a second. I was looking at some of the Warlord minis the other day. And I was like, oh my goodness, these guys are fantastic. I really love these things. Let's take a look at, uh, let's take a look at some of this stuff here. Here we go. So these are Assyrians from uh, Warlord. This is a war game, right? So why don't we do this? Why don't we just add a little twist to this? Why don't we, why don't we let these, these are guys from the Hail Caesar series? Why don't we think about just this jacket that this guy's wearing, but instead of being made with the, uh, with leather underneath it, but instead of being metal plates like this Assyrian commander, let's make it pieces of bone. Does that sound cool? All right. So we're leather banded with bone. In fact, we're gonna make it bare bones. Huh? <laughs> that's funny. So let's drop his armor class down to negative two. Okay, because it's more fanciful, mess nastier. Um, that'll be really neat. So we'll just get this back out of the way. Now, the damage type of these guys, you know, they're just saying hurling rocks for 3 to 30 hit points. But I want this character to be uh, more of a, he's more of an ambassador. So let's just give him some kind of a, uh, let's give him an awesome mace. Okay, you know those guys are using clubs that are carved out of stone. Let's make our stone giant guy more dignified and comes from a group. Maybe there's an outpost. They live in some mountains nearby in the, in the Yatel Mountains, maybe up north near the Tiger Nomads. Let's give him a, uh, a two-handed hammer. Okay? In fact, we're going to make it a plus four two-handed hammer. So normally, when you have a two-handed hammer, we just take a look at our DM screen. You know, how much damage does a two-handed hammer do? They don't really do a lot. But when you've got something that's giant size, it's going to do a lot more damage. Let me just go back to the uh, the damage table here for the weapons. These these damage tables are for good old fashioned normal run the mill weapons. They're not really just, they're not numbers for giant size weapons. So you got a two handed hammer here. Where is this? So you got a hammer, a lucerne hammer, a war hammer. It's doing like two to eight, two to five damage. Now compare that to the damage this guy was supposed to be doing with three to thirty hit points. Let's boost this up. Let's make this a uh, Let's do this as 3d10, 3d10, and we're going to add plus 4 for the bonus. So it's a plus 4 to hit. Also, this to AC 0, we're going to drop that down to 6. So it's almost like a player character. Okay? 
So we think he's got 11 health. Let's just give him max health. Let's just make him an even 90. Boom. One stone giant elder, done. Now that's pretty nasty. Wouldn't want to fight him. Someone's going to have to fight him. This is guys are in the front row. All right, next. We got a frost giant guy sitting next to him, right? Frost giant guy sitting next to the king. This guy should be maybe someone who wants to usurp the throne, take care of things on his own. Let's take a look at what the frost giants are going to be. Now I have a previous sheet. This is a typical sheet for an encounter of frost giant guys. So we're just going to call this a, uh, a frost giant. We'll call this a frost giant lord, okay? Not a jarl. A jarl is kind of like a Viking word for the king of the entire area. Let's give this guy a lord. Uh, we're not going to make up any names or anything. Let's put the hit dice here. We'll put the armor class here. Damage here. And we'll put the to hit AC zero. Whoops. Number here. And the reason I'm doing this because I want you to see how we come up with this stuff. Because it gives you a sense of game design and balance. Um, so let's put health here. And let's make any notes about weapon. And armor. And if you had pets or something, we'd have that too. So Frost Giant Lord. All right. So all our other Frost Giants were hit dice 10. Let's boost this guy up to hit dice 12. To an AC 0 for hit dice 10 guy. We're boosting this guy up to 12. So let's once again go look down to our uh, to hit table. Here we go. Here's the AC 0. So we're going to boost him up to 12. We're going to slide this over a little bit. So the AC 12 would be a 9. So that's pretty nasty. We're going to put a 9 default here. The armor class on a typical uh, Frost Giant is going to be a 4. So let's, you know, it's pretty straightforward, the Frost Giants. Everyone sees these guys. They're running around with the, they're running around with chain mail on and stuff like that. They just look like big Vikings. So it's not too hard to figure out. But like we did a few minutes ago, let's double check what we've got here in some of these latest editions that talk about Frost Giants from the perspective of personality and stuff like that. So... These guys are creatures with ice and snow, hair and beards are pale and light blue. They dwell on high peaks and glacials, reavers of the storm, rulers of might, make war, not goods. That's great. Primitive, bigger means better, voracious eaters, stupid and deadly, raging bullies. Okay, that's good themes. Now, Pathfinder is going to do the same kind of thing they did in 3.5. They're just going to kind of take that and run with it. So in this situation, what do we have? Uh, Frost giants, light blue, this is hair color. Chain shirts, metal helmets, decorate the horns and feathers. Ooh, I like the feather idea. Let's do this. Let's take this guy and let's give him AC zero. And let's give him this, uh, we'll give him plate with eagle feathers. An eagle feather cloak. Kind of like in Black Desert Online that one, I think it's the archer class that gets one of those. There's a cool cloak that you can get in some of the costuming in Black Desert Online. Just brilliant. You can even get barding armor for your characters. Um, and for a weapon, let's see. What could we do for this guy to make him really cool? So he's got this eagle theme. So maybe he lived up somewhere in the high mountain peaks and he has this big, massive, giant eagle he killed and slayed. Let's give him a dragon jaw um, mace. And he's going to dual wield them. That's even nastier. Even nastier. So, and his health, 12. Let's give him a basic 100 health right off the bat. So, what's he going to do? Let's give him a bonus to hit on this. Let's give him plus 4 on each of these. So, he's dual wielding these two crazy weapons. Let's do some kind of crappy sketch for you. So, you got a jawbone, right? Here's a, here's a normal lower mandible, right? So, if you're a dragon, you have these big nasty teeth sticking up like this. Big incisors, lots of little crunch crocodile teeth on the back. Like this. They got a big joint that sticks up like this. So this is kind of a crappy little mandible picture, right? All these little bones. You've seen this a million times in dinosaurs. So this guy's cut this thing in half. So you got this huge thing here. Maybe he has a metal haft on it. Big metal haft. And then this bone sticks through it. So he's got this leather wrapping on it going like this. Huge bone. It comes up and it bends up like this. And this is where the big dragon bone incisor is happening here. And it's got all these other nasty rows of shark teeth. Maybe like two rows of teeth. And it's got a huge bend here. Maybe he's polished it. Maybe he's attached some kind of a gem on the inside of it, carved it out, and it's all full of, like, Alaskan carvings. That's really cool. We could draw that for 20 minutes if we were a good artist, right? So you got this nasty, cool, jawbone-style mace. He's dual-wielding them, one in each hand. So he killed some dragon one day barehanded or whatever he did, and now he's using these. So that's going to give him a plus four to hit. That means this to hit AC zero is going to drop all the way to five. Now, these weapons, let's treat them as if they were uh, war hammers, 
okay? But they're single-handed, they're almost like axes. But let's see what the damage would have been on the Frost Giants by default. So we're gonna go up, go up to a, a page here for Frost Giants and just slide over. So the normal damage to them is like hurling rocks for two to 20 hit points, four to 24. Now early in our campaign, you can see here, these guys are doing 66 damage with two-handed weapons. So we need to kind of have the same level of damage. So let's give it 3d6 per hand. So that's the same number of six-sided dice. So this is going to go, so we're going to do this like this. We're going to do 3d6 plus 4. 3d6 plus 4. Wow, that's brutal. No special effects, no weapon drain, no life stealing, nothing like that. Armor class 0. Played with eagle feathers and cloaks. Let's make them white. In fact, let's make this uh, dragon jaw uh, mandible. There we go. That's good enough for him. So that's number two. This frost giant lord, he's a badass. That sounds really cool. We get, he can go, you can go sit down somewhere, dude. All right, what's next? What do we have next? We have a fire giant. Let's go back to our little throne room shot here. So we've got this third person here sitting on the frost in the fire giant. Now in G3, you need to kind of read ahead to the, uh, the Hall of Fire Giant King to see who would this be. But what we're going to do is to make up someone unique from scratch. So let's go back to our influencers again. Let's go all the way back to third edition. So if you have never played anything with fire giants like or any of those other dungeons, whoops, you uh, learn the lore behind these characters is fantastic. So let's go back to the fire giants in the first edition first. So there's the frost giant. The fire giant's going to be right here. So they say fire giants are often found in castles and caverns, blah, blah, blah. They have one to four hell hounds with them. Um, one to four, they encounter this, that, and the other. Adult fire giants are hurl rocks. They all hurl rocks in the first edition. Using huge weapons, they're like dwarves in many ways. Their skin is cool black on hair, flaming red and orange. So that's pretty typical. I mean, most pictures of artwork that you see that have a giant in it, that's the kind of look and feel. Uh, I recently posted some pictures on the Facebook page that have some of the beautifully painted uh, minis from uh, Reaper Bones. What is this? G, H, Gollum, Storm Giant, Fire Giant. Here we go. So what do we say here in 3.5? The art in this book is, suffers. Environment, warm mountains. That's not true. Um, hellhounds, Fire Giants are brutal, ruthless, or militaristic. Militaristic, that's an interesting word. Female, shorter, red, orange. Typical giant bag contains throwing rocks, miniature items, and a tender box. You know, you got to have a flaming sword, but let's just look at the other book. Let's just see what they did when they did the fourth edition. Because the Pathfinder one's going to be uh, exactly like it was in the third edition. Let's see if we can open this up without tearing it off. So we had giants, earth giants. Now this is a magnificent painting. I absolutely love this painting. So let's check this guy out here. Big two-handed flaming sword. We'll save that for the Hall of Fire Giant King, the big guy. So for this guy here, in fact, this is the picture we used with our phone. We made this button. Let's make it a female. So it's like a female ambassador. In fact, let's just use this complete picture here as inspiration. She's got this burning red, red dragon scale armor, two skulls around her neck, making, you know, kind of making like her uh, upper body armor, torso armor, a huge battle axe mace type thing. It's almost like she's a dr uh, fire giant cleric. That's really awesome. Very cool. Let's use that idea. Let's just double check real quick into 5th edition. Because 5th edition has, they really stepped up the art game in 5th edition. They did a really good job. Some of these are so painterly, they're almost like works of art. This is a great silhouette thing, really good thing. In fact, here's the other one. This isn't a really great picture of Fire Giant, just like a dude in plate mail that's overweight. It kind of looks like a Dodo character. So that's not very useful. Um, so that just gives you a sense of some of their basics. They're like stat blocks, not much information on them. Most of the information is over here. Let's go over here. Hill Giant, Stone Giant, Storm Giant, Frost Giant, Cloud Giant, Fire Giant. Okay. Fire Forge, Fortresses, Volcanic Heat, that's fine, that's fine. Smoky, Fire Giants, like cold, they shun cold, well, that Fire Giant's not having fun here. Martial Experts, okay, Feudal Lords. So how about that? We'll make her a Frost Giant, we'll make her the Princess. How about this Fire Giant female be the daughter of whoever is running a G3? How's that sound? Sound like a cool idea? All right, let's just start with this. So we'll say a Fire Giant... Um, princess, not Princess Bride, but it's like maybe it's the eldest daughter. I mean, she could be 60 years old for all you know. And we're going to need a hit dice number for her and a to hit AC zero. And we're going to need the AC number. And then down here we'll put the health. And the weapon. And armor. 
Now we already talked about some of these ideas already. Let's just get a line here. And the damage. And that's really all you need to run it for a combat situation. So the damage number and the hit dice is 11. I'm going to boost that by 1. So I'm just going to put this to 12. And the reason why I'm going to pump this up to 12 is not try to be sexist or anything. But that's going to put her over into the next bracket. Let's get down here to the, the monster hit numbers. Here we go. Here we go. So this puts her down to the next bracket from 10 to 11 and 11 to 12. So if you see this, let's reduce that in size just a little bit. You can see it better. There you go. So AC 0 going across horizontally here. This goes to 12, so that puts us down to 9, okay? That means to her to, her to hit AC0, she needs a 9. To AC0, she needs a 9. Um, we're going to give her, let's do the armor first. Uh, red dragon scale armor. Red dragon scale. Let's make it immune to fire. Immune to fire. Let's make her a fire giant princess. Let's make her a cleric, too. So we're going to give her a couple spells here. All right. We also do all healing and protection. We're going to give her heal, one heal. We're going to give her uh, protection, which will give her plus five, a massive giant version of to AC and rolls. And let's give her. What else could we give her that'd be interesting? Let's give her like a um, a patch wounds spell which is a cleanse. And we're just making this up, right? We're going to make her kind of like an EverQuest 2 kind of a character. So she's immune to fire. Um, let's just lower its armor class. The armor class on a fire giant is normally... What are we talking about? Armor class 3. Let's drop her down to armor class 0. The hit dice on a fire giant in first edition is 11. We said we're going to bump that up to 12. Uh, the damage. So let's give her... a. Um, Let's give her this black iron mace. That sounds something cool. So she's kind of a cleric. And let's give her a, uh, a red dragon scale shield, too. There we go. So she's got a shield and mace. So she's kind of like, in some ways, kind of like Antola here. So she's heavily armored, but it's a uh, scale mail. So it's not as low of an armor class. The damage on this. So she's not going to be really be a melee, but she uh, she can run up a melee and shield bash. Let's give her a shield bash. A shield bash. Let's do a 2d12 shield bash. The poor 12-sided dice never get much damage with that. And let's give her a mace hit. Of um, Let's do a 2d10 mace hit. This is a one-handed weapon. Health on her, 12, 96. Let's just give her an even 90 health. All right, there you go. Fire Giant Princess. She's done. Okay, now for the real fun part. Now for the fun part. What are we going to do for this guy here? Well, they got these two winter wolves here. we got some winter wolves here, right? What can we do with the winter wolves to make them interesting? Let's take a look at the first edition winter wolf before we do the Mr. Billy Badass. And after we get done doing these heroic characters here, we'll uh, um, wrap this episode up. Because we're almost about an hour at 42 minutes. So let's go take a look at uh, winter wolves here. Let's just do winter in a search tab winter wolves and let's make this a little smaller here you go winter wolf so by default winter wolves are the biggest one very rare hit dice six okay so let's going to call these uh, let's give these two names um, let's cut their frost giants let's call one let's see we we'll call one Sleet. And this one will be called Sleet. What do you want to call that one on call? Hmm. Sleet and Glacier. Okay. So, these are Winter Wolves. They've been bred. They're brother and sister. So, Glacier is going to be the female. This will be the male. So they're from the same litter. Hit dice, armor class, to hit AC zero, the damage, and health. And let's put special abilities here because they don't wear any gear. All right, so Winter Wolf. Now the Winter Wolf, if you look down here, they have this uh, cone of cold they can do. This is really nasty. This, this, read this to you really clear here. The Winter Wolf is a hard creature, yes. 
And let's pull this over to the side a little bit because it's being cut off on the camera a little bit. Let me slide this over. And pull this back up one notch and then we will slide it over. Okay. All right, so I'll just read through this here. So the frost causes 66 hunts of damage. They have a front bro uh, breath weapon like a blast of frost, which will root, uh, coat any creature with a one inches of the muzzle. So they have a short range cone of cold. So we're going to do a, uh, we're going to call it a cone of cold. Call it a howling blast. This will be like the uh, frost DK in World of Warcraft, howling blast. Now the base damage on that is just a uh, six to twenty-four. We're going to make that sixty-six. Sixty-six, and let's say they can do that three times per day, not once per day. Now, the number of attacks you're going to get per round here is number of attacks is just one. So we're just going to do a bite. So we're just going to have a bite damage, and let's do a three d six bite damage. Let's make these things nasty and big. For the hit dice, the hit dice is normally. What? It's not very high. If I remember correctly, it's like six. Let's make these hit dice eight. And to hit AC zero, the hit dice eight, what do you need? Hit dice eight, hit AC zero, so you need, they need 12. That's natural 12. Armor class on these things are leather hide. I'm not going to boost the armor class on these, so there's not wearing anything special. Let's just get rid of the search field. And armor class of these is like six. So we're going to leave the armor class low, so they're going to be able to be nailed and hit pretty easily. But they're going to be able to do this breath weapon thing three times more often and they're larger so and let's give them more health than uh eight hit dice would be 64 health we're going to give them 70 health each okay i'm just gonna put a notation next to this this will be the male sub f sub m and sub f all right great there's two winter wolf pets for our big king and now we need to do honking big dude right so what can we do for him you know earlier there's this one picture that I just absolutely love. Let me see if I can find it again. Let's go back to this 5th edition book. Let's see if I can find the picture I'm thinking of. There it is. This is the one I use for the, uh, for the tokens for these guys, right? So you took a picture of this on the phone. And you can see it's the same size. And use that to make these. Because it's for my own personal use. I'm not selling anything. So... This is a great picture of the king. Let's make this king an old, stoic frost giant. Like an old school guy. Like this guy is really old. Like gray beard and everything. Actually, you know what? We already painted him with a big red beard. So let's make him like young and impatient, powerful, brutal, and ruthless. Using his two-handed sword like we have here already. He's already got pieces of chain and plate on and massive bracers. So let's just go with that. We're going to call this the guy's name is Grugnur. Okay? If you go to the original module... And uh, they call him the Jarl here. But at the very first page of the whole module, let's just zip up there real quick, it tells you the name of him, which is kind of hidden away. Let's see if we can find this for you. I just want to make sure you can remember where it is. Oh, it's on this page somewhere. I'm trying to remember where it is. Where is this page? I can't find it off the top of my head really quickly here. But that was his name. They gave him a name. It was like Grugnor or something like that. So here it is. Here it is at the very top. Okay. Some dozen of leagues in the north and west of the Steading Hill Giant Chief, Model G1, the series amidst the tallest mountain peaks of the stronghold of Grug Nur, Lord of the Frost Giants. So that's going to call him that. Okay. G R U G Grug Nur. And he's the Lord of Frost Giants. So we're going to give him a hit dice number, an AC number to hit AC zero. And we're going to give him a damage number. And we're going to give him a health number. And then we give him any weapon and any kind of armor notes. So we really want this guy to be incredibly powerful and incredibly epic. Now, if you remember earlier, we were looking through this, uh, what's in the default module. Let's draw some inspiration from that, but let's not keep it exactly like they have it because we need to ramp up the power curve on this guy. 
So this page here, entry 21, is his private table here, the private entry. This is what they say about him. So they have him with a sword, a shield, and a two-handed at his hip. So this guy's going to use a two-handed. Um, let's redo him like this mini with the big cloak on. So the hit dice on these guys would normally be, I believe, it's like 10. We've been using 10 everywhere else in the campaign, right? We're going to give this guy up to hit dice 15. I know it sounds really crazy, but this is supposed to be the Lord of Frost Giants of all of Greyhawk. No other Frost Giant in the entire kingdom is going to be as nasty and as powerful as he is, right? So let's just call this Frost Giant. Dude, get us right to that page. There you go. So now this two to hit AC zero will hit dice fifteen. He's almost like you can't miss. So AC uh, hit dice fifteen is an eight. So it's not that much of a boost really. So to hit AC zero, he's only going to need an eight. Now we're going to give him a two-handed um, adamantite sword. Now the reason why we're doing this because it was a gift. Say it was a drow weapon. That means we're underground enough for this weapon to still work. So what we're going to do for this, we're going to give this a uh, 6d6 damage range as opposed to 3d6. And we're going to make this thing plus 5. So to hit AC 0, he needs an 8. When you rally with the plus 5, he only needs a 3. And the damage is going to be 66 plus 5. Now we don't do the we don't do the strength bonus for frost giants. That's kind of wrapped into the size of the weapon and the size of the damage that he does. So we should get this guy out of the way here. That's pretty nasty. 15. Uh, that'd be 80 plus another 40. Let's give him 150 health. That's a lot of health, but this is a raid guy. Okay, really nasty. Armor class. So we've got this mini here. We use his influence from a uh, Reaper Bone series. So the guy's got like a plate mail chest on. He got plate mail type bracers on. Um, got this ornate gold spot pauldron. So let's just basically call this plate mail. Um, let's, he's got this beautiful cloak, maybe like a cloak of protection on. Pretty nasty stuff. Bare arms. No big deal. Let's give him a really low armor class. Make him hard to hit. So if it, the group gets into a melee train and start trying to roll him. Now normally these guys are AC4. And you can see this from the adventure. All the other guys are wearing like chainmail jackets. Nothing magical. Let's say this guy's wearing a magical cloak. In fact, let's give him a magic item. Let's have, give him a cloak of protection to drop his armor class lower. And let's do his armor. Let's give him plus five plate. Okay, so let's take a look at the uh, DM screen to give you the armor class table on this. So here it is. So if you're just wearing plate mail and you use plate and shield, you're AC2. If you're using plate mail with nothing else, shield or just plate mail, it's AC3. So this will drop you down by five, okay? That'll give you a negative two armor class. That's not that amazing, but it's better than armor class four. So that's a difference. That's a pretty de decent difference. I'll give you a quick example of what it would take for one of the people in the party to hit him. So our, far our party, uh, party, our warriors. Let's take Zollers, for example. Zollers needs a six to hit AC zero. He need an eight to hit this guy. So this guy's still hittable. So if you had a situation where this guy was fighting uh, Mercedes and Zollers, um, they can hit him. He can hit them. Uh, this uh, the healths are relatively close. Could be pretty nasty, um, but he's going to need to rely upon you know he's got friends helping two Kona Cold Blast. That could be very very nasty. Remember, our party only has two he complete heals and a bunch of potions. So our druid may have to pick up the slack on the healing. We have to come up with an interesting strategy to kind of defeat this. So this is our big time guy here. Now before we get offline here and stop this video, what we want to do is make a, a list of everyone else. And I can make the everyone else things without making a video for it. It's not as exciting to watch. So we've got Grugner, Lord of the Fire Giants. That's this dude here. We've got Sleet and Glacier. That's the two Winter Wolves. The Fire Giant Princess. We'll come up with some kind of name for her. Uh, the Frost Giant Lord that's a visiting ambassador. And the Stone Giant Elder, who is some old guy who's visiting with his two-handed hammer. So there's our baddies for the next episode. That's very, very cool. Now let's do an inventory check. So I've got in here some pictures of everyone that's in the entire space like this. Here we go. So let's take a look at this. And what I'm going to do is um, let's go through and counter one. These two guys up here, if you look at the right-hand screen here where I click this, these two guys here got killed already. So what we have is everyone else in this entire room alive except for this group down here. All right? So let's count how many we have of each type. So, how many hill giants do you see? 
I see six. Where's Waldo? So we have Hill Giants. And we've got six of them. Let's just put a little quantity column here. Who and number. All right. So then how many Frost Giants do you have? Well, there's a table right to the east of them. There's one, two, three, four. Right? And there's a table just south of that. I can use my mouse cursor to point for you. So these two big, long, 10-foot wide by 20-foot long tables full of beer and everything. You've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine Frost Giants. Let's call these nine Frost Giants our uh, regular local guys that serve the king. So we have nine... Uh, local frost giants, meaning when I say local, I don't mean like they live in Florida or Texas or something or Norway. They are serve this guy. So they're in the back, right? Now that we had another frost giant that's visiting, remember? So we had the stone giant guy and we had this frost giant lord. This is with the two jagged, uh, dragon jaw dual wielder, right? This guy's dual wield. Not I want to duel you, but dual wield. So let's divide up the rest of the group into his group. So we got one, two, three in the front. Let's make those part of that group. So we've got three uh, Lord Frost Giants. Now they're just soldiers. Okay. And let's not forget this table way over here on the east side. And let's just throw these guys in with a... Uh, these three here with the random groups. We've got one here, one here, and one here. And this guy's sitting with Ogre Magi. So maybe the Ogre Magi and these guys are all in faction. They travel together or something. That makes sense. But these three Frost Giants here are probably like sergeants or something. So let's create three Frost Giant sergeants. Um, I call them a Frost Giant sergeants. So we'll just boost them up a little bit from the basic uh, numbers that we use all the time. Let's get rid of this stuff. And what else do we have? Okay, now we have these one, two, there's a stone giant here, so we have one more stone giant. We also have two uh, cloud giants, if I'm not mistaken. Let's, cause let's, look, let's dig up our 5th uh, edition, I think it was a 5th edition book, wasn't it, that had this picture. I could be mistaken, it could be uh, one of the Pathfinder books. Where we got that picture of that frost giant from? Here it is, cloud giant. See this guy here? So if you look on the map here on the right-hand side, we've got two cloud giants sitting this little round table in the back. They're just going to be regular old dudes that are visiting. Nothing too incredible about them. So we've got two cloud giants. Wow, that's nasty. What else do we have? Uh, we have one, two, three, four, five, six ogre magi. Um, I had those from before already figured out. We had those. They were in another room. They were going to be in another room. We had armsmen, and then we had a male leader. Uh, but they're all at the wassail. I have notes here about their little gold, their box and everything. These are the hill giants. These are the lackeys. So we're just going to list them. I've already got their stat sheets figured out, just like these frost giant stat sheets are figured out. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six. Ogre Magi. And they're all part of like an ambassador party that's coming to visit. So that should be everyone. Now in the original module, they talked about these area A. See this right here? And on the west side, in area B, these the sloping passages that go up and down, and with those two areas had uh, guards. Well, now that the big party's going on, there's no reason for there to be a guard because originally the description said that all these tables and chairs were pushed up against the walls. Well, now we get this huge, massive party in full swing. Everyone's having a good time. Um, wow, how are we gonna? How's our party gonna handle this? So what I may probably do here is I may put together a poll with a number of tactical options that are general themes of how to address this because. Uh, we may want to uh, think about this before you run in the front door. If you run the front door here, oh, there's one last thing I almost forgot. Look up here in the upper right-hand corner. This passageway here in the upper right-hand corner, this goes to an armory, and this passageway here had orcs coming and going from a kitchen. There's a kitchen here they didn't open up previously from the other side because a boulder was sealed. So you got one, two, three, four, five bugbears. So five bugbears. Now, we had bugbears and uh, standing the hill giant chief. These guys may have been guys who uh, came to visit that weren't part of that group. All right. That's pretty nasty, man. All right. 
So that's our episode now. That hopefully gives you a sense of like how to come up with and design and balance enemies to fit your campaign to give them personality so they aren't just the regular old run-of-the-mill uh, type of characters. So there's nothing wrong with using the regular old run-of-the-mill type of characters. If your party is a regular run-of-the-mill type of party, then uh, they, don't, they may have fun just mowing down 15 chumpy frost giants depending upon how much gear and weapons and armor they have. This party, our epic party here of seven, the seven here, they have high health, create tons of experience, decent man dam damage, fair armor class, not a lot of magic items. If this party had two casters and two thieves in it, it might be a completely different story. They are very melee trained. Between Vrinjar, Mercedes, and Zolaris, and then Elephanisi stuns, uh, we've got these casters. This is the melee train that are pretty much wiping out everything in the game. We've got two complete heals from a cleric. We've got some decent heals from the druid. The druid's air effect entangle is really, really good. We have the illusions, which is always a wild card because all these giants aren't real smart. Uh, they're very susceptible to illusions. But before we do anything, we're going to have to have everyone leave the area that they're in now and go regroup and get filled back up because they're not marching this room and kicking down the first beer mug and say, I challenge you to a duel to the death. So the first thing I think the party's going to need to do is get the devil out of the room they're in now. If you look at the picture on the right-hand side, this is where they fought the Ogre Magi. Everyone's standing here. They had the problem with Mercedes, who was charmed. I don't know if you remember that or not, but that's one of the things that happened in the last episode. This picture in the upper-hand corner, this is where everyone's standing when the next episode starts. So they're going to have to deal with that, get her subdued, or get a Dispel Magic, and pull her out of there and then move down to one of these other areas and get all their health and everything else recovered. They might even want to consider going to another section of the, of the module and trap Frost Giants as they come out. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a list of tactical options that are about a paragraph each and let the players in the Patreon community and Facebook page say which option should the group do. And then we'll have the party execute on that general plan before uh, we do the next big battle. I'm not just going to kick in the front door and have a nine-hour battle. We're going to give you a chance to come up with something tactical. But now you know what they're going to be up against. So it's like you're my co-DM on this one. So you can use a little bit of cheating because you know what they're going to be up against. But at the same time, they don't know what they're up against. They just know the quantity. All right, great. That's it for this episode. Hope you had fun with it. If you like these kinds of things behind the scenes, how you develop the encounters, why they're done a certain way, what's happened with it, um, Post feedback, share the stuff with your buddies who like first edition. If you like fifth edition and this kind of stuff is fun for you too, uh, you know, let me know. And eventually, uh, one day, I'll switch over to fifth edition. I want to get through all these uh, classic modules first because this is the 40 year anniversary. Once again, Classic DM, thanks for tuning in. Leave a comment, subscribe, share with your buddies, and we'll talk to you soon. Take care.